Our next speaker is actor and director Nick Searcy. Uh, he got his start in uh, New York and off-Broadway plays, and he's gone on to compile an impressive and long list of television and film credits. Far too many to mention here, but allow me to mention a few. On television, he's had roles on LA Law, I'll Fly Away, Return to Lonesome Dove, Thunder Alley, Nash Bridges, The West Wing, uh, Criminal Minds, uh, and Hawaii Five-0, among many others. Now, I have to tell you that my favorite television role of his was as Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal Art Mullen on the FX series Justified. Um, I, co I confess to being a bit nervous that I'm going to get something wrong in this introduction, and he's going to get up here and yell at me the way he used to yell at Raylan Givens. Um, his multiple big screen credits include Days of Thunder, Fried Green Tomatoes, The Fugitive, Cast Away, The Shape of Water, Moneyball, and The Best of Enemies. He's also directed two movies, Carolina Lowe, and most recently, Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer, which was released in 2018. Uh, as many of you know, he's not afraid to voice his political opinions. Uh, the fact that they're conservative opinions uh, makes him something of an outlier in Hollywood, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, he's been a guest on The Andrew Clavin Show, Louder with Crowder, and The Greg Gutfeld Show, and he has been a guest host of the Rush Limbaugh radio show. Uh, his topic today is politics in Hollywood. Would you please welcome to the podium Nick Searcy. All right. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say thank you for that introduction, Timothy, and, and how honored I am to be here. Actors aren't generally accepted into polite society that often, and I, I appreciate it very much. I've been a big fan of Hillsdale College for a long time, taking some of their online courses. I think I passed one of them. And, and I just want to thank Scott Hall and, and, and Larry Arn and, and Matt and Kim and, uh, for all they did in bringing me here. It's really an honor. So. And uh, that being said, I, as excited as I am to be here, I can't imagine how excited all of you must be. Um, because I know you're all worried about what Hollywood thinks about you, you know. And let me just say at the outset, most of the time we don't think about you at all. We're thinking about ourselves, right? We're thinking things like, you know, does this suit make me look fat? And, you know, maybe I should get that thing taken off my face and that sort of thing. That's what we're generally thinking about. It's not you. But uh, I know it probably keeps you up at night wondering why, why don't the people who are friends of Harvey Weinstein think I'm a good person? <laughs> But that's why I'm here. That's why they brought me here. I, in the, in to, with apologies to Ronald Reagan, here are eight of the most terrifying words in the English language. I'm from Hollywood, and I'm here to help. <laughs> so being an outlier, as Timothy said, I'm asked a lot of questions. And one of the things I'm usually asked is, why is Hollywood the way it is? Why is it so uh, monolithically left? especially when they are in one of the most directly transactional capitalist businesses in the world. I mean, show business is really just an episode of The Little Rascals <laughs> where Spanky and Alfalfa want to put on a show for the neighborhood and they're going to charge five cents and if it's a good show, they'll make money and if it, it's a bad show, they'll fail. That's, that's what Hollywood is, basically. So it's pure capitalism. Why don't they understand that? Well, there are various answers to this question, but I want to tell you one story. My, uh, my first cousin, Gary, I was born in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Not, not that many years ago, thank you. <laughs> and my, uh, when I first moved to Hollywood in the uh, 90s, my, my cousin Gary came out to visit me, and Gary was in the weaving business. He, had a, he made rugs, and he went all over the world with this business, and sold in China overseas. He did very well with it, but he was out in Los Angeles for a, a trade show. And he uh, came to me one night after he'd been there for a couple of days, and we'd had a few drinks, and he said, you know what, Nick? I've got L.A. figured out. 
I know why everything is so screwed up here. And I said, well, tell me what it is. And he says, well, for a hundred years, the craziest people in America have moved to Hollywood to try to become movie stars and they've made it and they had kids. <laughs> and I was wondering if he was including me in that, but, but I do think that's part of it. But I also think that there's a certain amount of groupthink and intimidation going on here because it's so difficult to get a job in this business. The, the sheer numbers are just completely unfavorable to a newcomer. It's practically impossible. <clears throat> and the late great comedian Louis C.K. had a great line about this. I mean, he's not really dead, but he's just canceled. You know? <laughs> leftist on leftist action is just irresistible to me. I can't stop watching it. But <clears throat> he had a great line about it, and it was uh, saying that you want to be a professional actor is like saying that you want to be a cartoon dog wearing a jet pack. <laughs> it's just about as likely. Um, so there's so many reasons that uh, a, a given actor doesn't get a job. You know, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too old, you're too smart. That's just what happens to me a lot. <clears throat> you want to give them as few reasons as possible to reject you, right? So it, it makes more sense to join the club. And that's what the bullies that are the enforcers in Hollywood do here. They speak out publicly constantly <clears throat> to send out the signal that if you want to be in this business, you've got to join the club. In a perfect example, take uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient Robert De Niro. You thought I was going to say Rush, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Did I mention that I guest hosted for Rush once? I don't know if I've mentioned that yet. But uh, yeah, Obama gave De Niro the same Medal of Freedom that uh, Trump gave Mr. Limbaugh. Um, but of course, when Trump gave it to Rush, he made all the Democrats watch it, which is... <clears throat> One more reason to love President Trump, but <clears throat> at the Tony Awards in 2018, Robert De Niro got up there and thought it would be perfectly fine to repeatedly yell, Duck Trump. I said duck with a D. He didn't say that. He said something else. Just to be clear, I said duck, Larry. I said duck. And he's called, uh, he's called Trump a gangster. He's called him Hitler. He's called him uh, racist, a white supremacist. You know, all the same things that Democrats call every single Republican president and every presidential candidate, going back to even Romney and McCain when they uh, tried to convince us that they wanted to beat Obama. <clears throat> But he, Mr. De Niro also recently made headlines when he said he hoped the president would be hit in the face with a flying bag of excrement, although he didn't say excrement either. <clears throat> and just bear in mind, when he says things like that, he really wants to hit everybody who voted for Trump in the face. That's a lot of excrement, so it's a good thing that the Democrats have San Francisco. They're going to need it. <laughs> But people are always asking me, why do these actors do this? Why, why do they repeatedly just go out of their way to insult the entire Trump electorate? Don't they care about their business? I said, well, the first thing is I, I truly believe a lot of it is, is to intimidate. They want to intimidate everybody into believing that if you want to be in show business, you've got to support the Democrats, you've got to hate the Republicans. And uh, there's been a lot of talk in the last few years and within the circles of conservative Hollywood, which is a very small and intimate circle, um, <laughs> about whether or not there is actually a blacklist. And the fear of this blacklist is what led to the establishment of uh, the top secret conservative fellowship group in LA that you probably have all heard of, so it's not so secret, but uh, for most of the Obama years, this group was a, kind of a safe haven for actors and writers and people like me who aren't leftists and don't believe stuff like, well, real socialism has never been tried, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and it sort of functioned like an AA meeting for Republicans. It was like we would all get together and we'd stand up and we'd go, hi, my name is Nick and I, I vote for Republicans. <laughs> Republicans. <clears throat> 
I miss that group. <laughs> but, but while there may not be an actual blacklist, there may be, but there may not be, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't need to be. Because Hollywood is a, is a town that's run by fear and filled with cowards, and a whisper campaign is all it takes. And I, all the decisions are also made by committee. So 14 people have to sign off on every actor that they cast, especially if it's in a major role. So if one person in that room just goes, I don't like that guy, that's it. They don't even have to say why. They don't have to say, I don't want Nick Searcy to do it because he voted for Trump and he's not ashamed of it. They're, they don't even have to say that. They just go, I think we can do better than him, you know. And now, since Trump's been elected, he's torn the masks off of everybody, which is one of his superpowers. But the leftists in Hollywood don't even bother to hide it anymore. They, they, they blast their, their McCarthyite tendencies all over the media, and, and they know, do that knowing that they're going to get more work, not less. They're going to get more work if they do that. For example, Trump fundraiser in Beverly Hills last September, when it was announced, Will and Grace got involved. You remember Will and Grace? Yeah, I never watched it either. <laughs> but Deborah Messing felt comfortable asking for names. She tweeted, please print a list of all attendees. The public has a right to know. And then Will got involved, Eric McCormick. Hey, the Hollywood reporter, he said. Kindly report on everyone attending this event so the rest of us can be clear about who we don't want to work with. Thanks. <clears throat> At least he said thanks. But there are so many well-known actors, people that you would recognize by face, if not by name, who they say to me all the time, man, I agree with you, but I would never say it out loud because I know it would hurt my bottom line, and you're crazy. <laughs> and they are undoubtedly correct and smarter than me. But Hollywood used to make a movie about McCarthyism about every 15 minutes. It's, it's like their favorite subject. De Niro himself made one called Guilty by Suspicion in 1991. And the reason it's one of their favorite subjects is that it allows leftists to paint themselves as the abused victims of evil Republicans, even though it was their own colleagues in Hollywood that blacklisted them. It wasn't, wasn't Congress. It was the people they worked with. <clears throat> so... Why do they act like, in real life, like the bad guys in their movies that they make? And it's because they're rewarded for it. <clears throat> if you make some vile, ignorant, hateful statement about a Republican, that's a resume enhancement in Hollywood. That, that shows you're in the club. Shows you're one of them. Like, it's better than an audition. It's better than a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. And the more hateful it is, the better. The more Alec Baldwin attacks Trump, the more Emmy nominations he gets. That's the way it works. And they never pay a price for it. They are insulated from paying a price for it. If you're a name that producers are willing to pay millions of dollars for, like De Niro, you're considered you're, you're royalty. And no one in Hollywood can say excrement to you. <clears throat> And the studios have protected themselves, too, by cross-collateralizing everything. For example, if you, if you like Game of Thrones and you subscribe to HBO, you're also subsidizing Bill Maher and Vice and countless documentaries about how wonderful Nancy Pelosi is and how awful Republicans are, and that's just the way they've done it. They can make one Avengers movie that makes a billion dollars, and that gives them a chance to make a bunch of other movies that they're just making for each other. They're just making to show off and say, look, I'm in the club. Look how woke I am. Look at this movie I made. So that's how it works. And so the message gets sent. If you want to succeed, you've got to be in the club. And if you aren't in the club, they're not going to let you in. If you have a story that you want to tell, a movie that you want to make, and it doesn't fit their ideology, ideology that's a tough word, they won't touch it. Either they won't touch it or they'll put you in a box. A lot of the studios have created these divisions that are for faith-based films. And so they put it over there and say, we're going to make these films for those people because they'll probably pay for it, but we don't want them to be associated with our mainstream films, 
right? They put it over to the side so they can make a little money on it, but they've identified it, they've targeted it, and they've dismissed it. And what that ultimate effect is, is that they are marching down the field of culture unopposed. Left never wants to win fair and square, right? They, 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 don't, they can't do it. They can't win on their ideas, so they have to clear the field. That's why they want to silence everybody that speaks out against them, and they don't want to have movies made that are against their ideology. They throw the word fascism around, and they probably couldn't define it if their next government check depended on it, because they are the fascists, and they don't realize it. So what this all means is, my friends, we as conservatives, we have got to get in this game somehow. We have got to get in the field of entertainment. We got to put the pads on and the helmet on and get out there and hit somebody, like my football coach in high school used to say. Um, he used to say, you know, those people over there on the other side, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like we do. They don't set them up over there in the corner and run and jump into them. They're just like us, so that's, that's how we got to look at the Hollywood left. We're just as good at it as they are. But the left has had this long march through the institutions, virtually unopposed, except for Hillsdale College. And uh, I wish I could say for places like Hillsdale College, but I can't because there isn't any other place like Hillsdale College. And it, all of that has brought us to this point where the Democrat Party is about to nominate a full-blown, unashamed communist for president. They're about to nominate Bernie Sanders. They rave about Putin, and they're about to nominate a communist. <laughs> and when you see all these young lunatics that are at the Sanders uh, 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 rallies ripping their shirts off and, and grabbing the mic away from him, it's, it, you, you have to wonder, how did this happen? How did we get to this point? where we have so many historically ignorant young people who embrace socialism. Well, my friend Jesse Kelly, who's a talk radio show host out of Houston, he put it like this. Start going to a government school at the age of six. Keep going until you're 22. Spend seven hours a day learning how bad America sucks and almost nothing about the deadly evils of communism, and then you'll understand Bernie Sanders. So now if you add on top of that the fact that every bit of mainstream entertainment that they consume from the time they're old enough to watch Teletubbies, is, it reinforces the same ideas. Republicans are racist, Christians are hypocrites, progressivism is compassionate, America's evil and imperialist. I mean, that, that's constantly beat into their heads. But there is a vastly underserved audience out there that has an appetite for entertainment that does not demean them or our country. And we have to make entertainment for this audience. And we have to find a delivery system for it. Now, a couple of years ago, I directed a, a movie that did go around the system called Gosnell. I think a few of you clapped when you saw that. Everybody who didn't see that movie, get out. <laughs> um, but Gosnell is a, is a movie about the real life case of an abortion doctor, Kermit Gosnell, who was convicted in Philadelphia in 2013 of multiple cr crimes, including murder for snipping the necks of babies after they had been born, which is now legal in New York. Um, but we had to go around the system. The money was raised on Indiegogo. It was successfully raised in 2014. We shot it in 2015. The movie was finished by early to mid 2016, and it took nearly two and a half years to find a distributor to release the movie in October of 2018. And that happened. We had a very reputable sales agent on board. He had sold a lot of movies in the past, and he watched the finished film. He says, this is a good movie. It should sell very quickly. He got one offer for $50,000. And, and he got responses like this. It's a good movie, and I'm sure there's an audience for it, but I have to work with these people on Monday. So the distribution companies are afraid 
that they'd be kicked out of the club if they were involved with Gosnell. And in the advertising, when we had a release date, the advertising, we got pushed back on that. Facebook blocked our ads. NPR refused to run ads that, that contained the word abortion doctor. Lifetime and Hallmark, two, two networks whose audience would intersect with our audience, they wouldn't run any of the ads. The only network would, that would take our ads was, guess what? Fox News, that's right. And we got some airtime from talk radio. Glenn, Glenn Beck gave us a great uh, hour-long spot, and, and my close personal friend Rush talked about the movie. <clears throat> Did I mention that I guest hosted for Rush? <laughs> But even given that resistance, given all that stuff, Gosnell, when it was released in 600 theaters, we were the number one indie film in the country that weekend, and we cracked the top 10 overall. And the reviews were typically polarized. Half of them hated it. Half of them loved it. But the ones that hated it slammed it as right-wing propaganda, of course. But the really surprising thing about the reviews was the number of them. Films released generally in that many theaters, 600 or more, always get at least 100 reviews, and some get up to 200. Gosnell got 11 reviews, 11. And they, ultimately, they treated the uh, movie like they treated the trial. They just tried to ignore it. They pretended that it didn't exist. We tried to make a film that was based as much on as much as possible on actual court transcripts and direct interviews with the principal real-life players, we tried to stay close to the facts because we didn't want to be dismissed as propaganda. But guess what? They called it propaganda anyway. Um, I'm going to show a clip from the movie now, that, uh, and this is a clip of the scene. When I read the script, this is why I wanted to direct the, the film, is because it was, so, it was just information that I didn't know. I didn't really know what a real abortion was, and I thought that was important information that everybody should have, no matter what side of the issue you're on. So this is a, a scene with Gosnell's defense attorney cross-examining a, uh, a good abortion doctor, an abortion doctor who's legal, and who was called by the prosecution to show the difference between what Gosnell did and a legal abortion. So, Ted? <clears throat> Dr. North, how many abortions would you say you've performed in your career? I have performed over 30,000 abortions. Wow. In the second trimester, what method of abortion do you use? Mostly D&E, dilation and evacuation. Yes, dilation is where you soften and widen the woman's cervix, correct? That is correct. Once the fetus grows larger, it's very important that we do that to prevent the cervix from tearing as the fetus is removed. And then you ev evacuate the fetus. You re remove it from the womb. Yes. But first, we have to make sure that it's not a live birth. Oh, of course. Of course. How do you do that? Well, we inject potassium chloride into the heart of the fetus. Hmm. With one of these, correct? Yes. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce uh, Defense Exhibit 1A on the screen. May I publish? You may publish. Now, this is a sonogram of a 23-week-old fetus. And so when you inject the fetus, do you put the needle here? No. Here? Yes. Right there. And that stops the heart. That's correct. And then you use forceps. You use these and you reach up in there and you grab a hold of an arm or a leg or whatever and you pull on it until it comes out or comes off. Correct? That's correct. But with larger fetuses, they remain intact. Of course, because the head's bigger makes it more difficult. What do you do then? We use a machine to suction out the gray matter. The gray matter, the brains. So you suction out the brains, and then what happens? Then the skull collapses, and the fetus can be removed. Right. 
Now, isn't it true that sometimes in order to get the suction machine into the fetus, you have to use a pair of scissors to make a hole in the back of the neck? Sometimes this happens, yes. So before when you said that you'd never cut the neck of a fetus. I was referring that... to a live birth. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I get it now. Have you ever had a live birth during an abortion attempt, doctor? No, I have not because we listened to the sonogram to ensure that the fetal heart has stopped. Well, what if you made a mistake? We don't. Well, what if you did? Objection, hypothetical, Your Honor. Your Honor, she's a medical expert. I'd like to have her opinion. Overruled. I'm going to allow the question, but stay on point, Counselor. What would you do if the baby was out and it was breathing? We would is issue comfort care. Comfort care? Can you define that for us? That's keeping the fetus warm and comfortable. Eventually, it will pass. Eventually, it would pass. So basically, you'd... you'd let it die. Seems like it'd be more humane to just take a pair of scissors. Objection! Withdraw the question, Your Honor. I know. That's one of my favorite actors, too. I, I love that guy. Um, <clears throat> but that's the scene that most of the negative reviewers called right-wing propaganda. Gosnell's defense attorney was essentially saying, what's the difference? The, the result is the same. And that's what he said during the actual trial. And the man was a pro-choice attorney he was, who was making the argument. But the left isn't interested in that. They don't want those facts to be out there. The entire subject is something they don't want to talk about. The only thing you need to know about abortion in the Hollywood narrative is that if you oppose it or even want restrictions on it, you are a racist who hates women, and you can't be in the club. That's it. So if we want to tell our stories, we've got to build a new Hollywood, because that one's broken. And I don't just mean content. We have to build a delivery system to, to, to bring the content to the audience that wants to see it. And I think the first step that we have to make to achieve this is that we as conservatives have got to recognize the power of storytelling. The left has dominated that field forever. Conservative investors are generally not disposed towards financing feature films or television shows that aren't documentaries. And it's not just because they're risky investments, which they are, it's because we don't perceive the value of storytelling. Now, Jesus spoke in parables. He didn't come out and just say, here are the facts, people, although he did that sometimes. But he, he, he taught through storytelling. And that's what, we have to, that's what we have to learn. Conservatives like to fund news networks, and they like, but not sitcoms, because they don't see the value in it. A friend of mine put it like this. If the conservatives were building the library, it would be all nonfiction. And if the liberals built the library, it would all be novels and poems and short stories. And of course, the liberals' library would be a lot more fun to visit. And that, I mean, that's where I would go, because it'd be a lot more popular, because storytelling is popular. Storytelling helps people learn. I'm about to use one of the most overused quotes in 21st century conservative speeches, but that's not going to stop me. Andrew Breitbart once famously said, politics is downstream of culture. We have let the Hollywood left define the culture for at least 50 years. But we have an opening now because Hollywood has destroyed itself. They've revealed themselves by expressing their seething contempt for everyone who disagrees with them. They've alienated themselves from a, a large portion of America. Because now when you hear, when a middle America hears the word movie star, they don't think anymore, oh, that's, 
That's someone beautiful and handsome who acts in movies and makes me feel emotions that I don't generally feel. My, no, we don't think that anymore. When somebody hears movie star, it's like, oh, eh, that's just another idiot who hates me because I won't vote for socialism. So they've, they've, they've really left us a huge opening. So how do we do it? How do we build a new Hollywood? Well, my idea is that the entertainment business needs its own Rush Limbaugh, whose show I hosted on December 27th, <laughs> 2017. <clears throat> but here's, here's what I mean by that. For, for all the young whippersnappers out there, um, and I'm, there's a couple of them, uh, <laughs> but it, it's really hard for people who weren't alive back then to understand what life was like before Rush Limbaugh because there was no one, and I mean no one, like him. There was no Fox News, there was no Hannity, there wasn't even really talk radio as a national format. There was no alternative to the alphabet networks and the, the biased news reporting that they do, and Rush by himself pretty much destroyed the monopoly that the left had on the news business. And his effect on the culture has been immeasurable. And that's why they've tried and failed for 30 years to destroy him, because they know how effective he is. Rush changed Andrew Breitbart. Rush changed me. And basically, we have to accept the fact that we are the counterculture now. Not them, not Hollywood. We are the sex pistols, people. <laughs> we are the punk rockers. And we need to pick up this mantle. You know, if. If there had not, I always think if, if Rush Limbaugh had existed during the Nixon years, he might not have resigned. He might have just thought, hey, that guy's on the radio fighting. Maybe I'll fight too, you know? And I would argue right now that without Rush, there would be no President Trump. That's how much he changed the culture. And speaking of President Trump, because at the end of the day, we all know everything is about President Trump. <laughs> One of the reasons that the left is so ineffective against him and why they hate him so much is that President Trump comes from the culture. He doesn't come from politics. He comes from the culture. He had a reality show for years. American people got, got comfortable with him. They got to know him a little bit, and they got a sense that this is a real person. It's not a focus group phony like, like almost every single politician that we've encountered, you know, like <coughs> Mitt Romney. <clears throat> <clears throat> and like Rush, Trump does not filter himself. He doesn't put on airs. He doesn't focus group his thoughts. He just talks to us, right? Tells us what he thinks. Whether it's on Twitter or whether it's walking to the helicopter going, no, not you, fake news, fake news, no, shut up, no, not you, don't be rude, don't be rude, you, you, no. my favorite thing about him. And it did the Daytona 500, wasn't that great? It was just, it was just so good. I mean, it ruined the day for the five or six Democrats who actually watched NASCAR, but other than that, just great. But in closing, I, uh, I have a candidate that I would like for you to consider backing as the Rush Limbaugh of entertainment. He has worked in Hollywood for almost 30 years. He's already directed one movie that affected the culture positively. He's getting ready to direct two movies in the next 18 months. One, one set in the world of gospel quartet music, which of course is a very sexy subject that Hollywood won't touch. And then after that, a movie about the Battle of Kings Mountain and the Revolutionary War, which is the first battle that America won. And I, he's working with a group called American Pictures to make this uh, slate of movies like this uh, that will be pro-faith, pro-America, and that's why Hollywood doesn't want to do them. That's right. <clears throat> this man is also working with a group that's creating a new streaming service and a content platform called Creado, which will compete with Netflix and YouTube, and it'll do so without censoring conservative voices or narratives. And he is also the biggest Hollywood star to have ever guest hosted the Rush Limbaugh program. <laughs> Ted, let's see that man right there. Yeah.
Thank you for having me. For those of you that brought your checkbooks, I'll be at the bar. I'm from Hollywood, and I'm here to help. Thank you. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions that I can't answer, you know, let's have it. <clears throat> Wonderful. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. <laughs> How many years will it take to overcome that Democrat Florida, that's a Democrat Hollywood to a, making it a Republican Hollywood. <laughs> I, I don't know if we're ever gonna see that, but uh, I, I really do think though that there's an opening to create an alternative to Hollywood and maybe the alternative to Hollywood will overtake it. I think that's the way to do it. I don't think they're gonna let us join them. We're gonna have to go around them or over them. We open. Nick, it was a pleasure meeting you last night. I, I'm, I'm a type of person that is not into uh, shameful promotion. I am an actor too, <laughs> but not as good as you. You are a very good actor, and uh, well, and thank I, you. And I just want to let you know that um, I served in the Vietnam War. I didn't fight, did, didn't almost lose my life, but I did ser serve as a certified OB technician. To see what I saw on that film uh, on abortion really affected me. If there's anything I can do, I would do it. And um, my career hasn't taken off because I let them know who I was, a conservative Christian Republican. And uh, if I can just shamefully endorse myself <laughs> to, to, be, to, to be a help to you. I'll keep you in mind. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> Here's an unanswerable question that Dennis Prager does not know the answer. I want your answer as to why the Jewish people are ultra-liberal in the progressives. This is a tough question. Well, I can't. Yeah, you're right, it's unanswerable, but I'll fall back on my friend Rush, who says basically, liberals are always liberals first. Doesn't matter what else they are. They're liberals first. They're leftists first. So even the Jewish people, any, any Christian people, anybody, if they're, if they're liberal, they're, they're liberals before their religion. So. My, my question is, um, Phil Anschutz, wouldn't he be a champion of what you're trying to do? Who? Phil Anschutz, the Colorado billionaire who's owned railroads, oil, and he's produced Christian movies. Uh-huh. And I'm just, made me think of him. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not familiar with him personally, but I will say that one of the problems with defining movies as Christian movies means that no one but Christians are gonna go see it, right? So that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to overcome. They, they wanna put us in the box and say, that's a Christian movie. If you're not a Christian, don't go see it, right? So we need to start making movies that sneak up on people, you know, <laughs> that have the message in there, but they, don't, they aren't just identified with a big, like, you know, this is a Christian movie, you know. Yeah, I do. I do. If he's got that kind of money, I do need to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll overlook that. I'll... <laughs> yes. Thank you. I've got cash. You accept that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> More seriously, can you, will you comment on the Clarence Thomas movie that came out January 31st and is not very widely distributed. Yes, I, well, you know, I don't know that much about that specific movie, but I do know, you know, Dennis Prager came out with a, a documentary called No Safe Spaces, which got a little bit of play, but yeah, a lot of people did see it. But I think part of the problem, me personally, this is just my opinion, I think this documentaries have a very limited appeal. And, and some are better than others. Obviously, some do, do better business than others. But I think 
really, if we want to really affect the culture, we're going to have to start telling them stories with big stars like me in it, you know. <laughs> so my husband and I have a Hillsdale graduate from four years ago, and she is passionately pursuing trying to get into acting. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, as her mom uh, and dad, we're, I'm just trying to support her. But after hearing what you've said today, I, you know, I, I don't know whether to have a lot of hope for her. But I still want to uh, give her encouragement. But I would like to hear if you were her dad, what would you, what kind of words would you say to her? I would say to her, the world needs plumbers. <laughs> we don't need actors, we got enough. No, but seriously, what I would say to her is what I say to a, a, most everybody who asks me that question. Create your own content. That's, that's how the world is now. That's how people become stars now in Hollywood. They don't do it by doing a play and having an agent come see them. That's the old way. The way they do it now, they create their own content. They get 10 zillion Instagram followers, and they get good at making films and, and being a storyteller and being a creator of media. And so that, I, that if, you, if she could do that, I think that's the best way. So. Who else? A question on the speaker's left. Left to the speaker. I'm sorry, <laughs> lights are in my eyes. <laughs> Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Oh, thank I you. have two things I'd like to say. First of all, the abortion that was very powerful, very powerful, all of us. I just don't know why we can't just start not using public funds, because what you just showed, I paid for. That is the hurtful part of it. Second thing I want to say is Harrison Ford, who we all, I understand he was going to have this movie, Call of the Wild. What little boy didn't read Call of the Wild or Girl? I was so excited to tell my husband there's going to be a new movie that we might actually go to, Call of the Wild. And he was all excited, Harrison Ford or whatever. Harrison Ford, three days later, got, tell us, will you tell us what he did? How he screened <laughs> obscenities about Trump when he was supposed to be talking about the movie. We will not go to that movie. Well, yeah. Well, this is kind of what I was talking about, is that they, Harrison Ford's not going to feel any consequences for that. He's already got his, right? The reason he says that stuff is to telegraph to everybody else, I'm in the club. I'm one of you guys, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that Harrison Ford doesn't actually believe what he's saying. I'm saying that that gives him permission to speak that way because he knows he doesn't have to answer to you. He doesn't have to answer to the audience. You know, he's, he's already got his money. So he's going to say whatever he thinks, and if you don't like it, he doesn't care. And that's, that's why there's an opening for us now. Hollywood universally is doing this. They don't care that we have a bad reaction to being called the names that they call us. Right? They've already got theirs. We've got to create ours. Right. We have a question on the speakers, right? Nick, hi. What's the budget for your project? Um, one is, uh, well, I'm, I'm, we're working at a $12 million budget for the Gospel Quartet movie right now, and uh, about $8 million for the Revolutionary War movie, which uh, may not make a lot of sense, but if you, if you saw what we had to work with, you'd know why. And uh, we do have a company, that company, American Pictures. I, I'm working with them. We're trying to raise the money that way. If anybody's got any money, you can talk to me later. No. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, we're working at about... And what they're trying to do is raise enough money to make a slate of films so that the risk is minimized. You don't, you're not just putting all your eggs in one film. You're making a slate of films that all have the same kind of basic thrust, which is... We actually like America. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have a Jewish friend who believes that God sent Trump to save our country. My mother thinks this too. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> the, the other thing is, there's another movie made, true, it was true, about a girl, a woman, who was very instrumental in an, an abortion clinic. 
and very much for it until she witnessed an abortion. Mm -hmm. And then she was so against it, she was able to close, all, close down that clinic. I think it was in Texas, and I can't think of the name of the movie, but very good. That's it. Unplanned, yeah. It was a movie called Unplanned, which uh, the biggest mistake they made was not putting me in that. <laughs> Would have been a lot better. Question on the speaker's left. Uh, you obviously want money, but in addition to that, have you given consideration to developing a group of people who are writing the kinds of stories you would like to see and make into films? Yeah, I mean, there's a network of us, yeah. We are, there's a, that's going on. You know, we, we are kind of working on, I've got four or five projects right now I'm trying to develop, and, and I know people that are doing the same thing, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of, we're, we're going into uncharted territory here. You know, we have to find a way in. And that's part of what the uh, Criado idea that I was talking about, which is a platform that will, will accept our movies and allow us to deliver them to, uh, to conservatives, to people who are sick of Harrison Ford talking about them the way he does, <laughs> and that sort of thing, so. Question on your speakers, right? Hi, that, your response kind of is in line with what I was going to ask. If you make these films and don't get the distribution, are there other avenues that you can release them and make money? Yeah, and that's, what, that's, that's part of the infrastructure that, that has to be built. I mean, it's going to take, it's going to take some serious money, you know, because basically what you're building is a studio as well as the content provider, as well as the distribution system. So we're going to need a lot of money. Everybody get ready. Is Clint Eastwood part of your collaborative group? It seems to me like he would be a, a good addition to it if he's not already. He, well, Clint Eastwood doesn't need a group. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing about Hollywood, too, is like with, with people like Clint Eastwood and even Mel Gibson in, in some regard, you know, that if you are that big, you don't, you know, they'll, they'll go, they'll, they know that your movie is going to sell regardless. So they're going to do business with that. They're going to do business with Clint Eastwood, right? But that's, that's different than sort of doing business with a relative nobody like me. Yeah. We're hearing a lot about what's happening and, and, and the difficulty of it, but haven't heard how do we as individuals, as a society, impact and influence the change or make the help make the change happen. That's another kind of side question. As we understand, there's quite a number of people in Hollywood who have the same belief as you and we. Uh, maybe you might want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we are all going to have to come together at some point. I mean, one of the characteristics of conservatives is that we're all about individual liberty and, uh, and freedom. And sometimes that doesn't make us the best collaborators, you know. So I think in some ways we, we, we do have a trouble kind of all getting together because a lot of us are thinking, well, that guy's part's bigger than mine. Or, you know, what, what, what is my role here? So I don't know if that answers your question, but we, we have to find a way to uh, come together on a common goal, basically. Question to the speakers left in the back. Hi, and thank you very much. Does this attitude cut across through theater and symphony, or is that beyond what you can speak to? No, I think it does. I mean, I, I think that, um, I was talking about this at lunch. I mean, I think there's a certain type of person that is attracted to going into the theater. And those are theater, those are people that are maybe more storytellers, more, um, what's the, they live in, in an empathetic world. They want to, um, you know, feel what other people feel and present that. And, and so that makes them less analytical, I would say, than, than people who look on at the theater from the outside who go into more skilled sort of medical fields or that kind of thing that, you know, you'd, you hear about a lot of child actors. You don't hear about a lot of child brain surgeons. You know, 
there's a, <laughs> there's a certain type of person, and I'm one of those people. I was attracted to that. I wanted to be an actor from the time I was 12 years old. I just didn't know that you couldn't also be a conservative. I had to find that out the hard way. <laughs> I have heard, have heard one definition of an actor right here. <laughs> Where, I'm sorry. That is a person oh. who, who uh, is told how to walk, where to stand, what to do, and what to say, and then they turn around and tell us how we should be. Right. Yeah. It reminds, I think it was the Seinfeld line. Jerry Seinfeld has this line about, you know, at the Oscars, it's like, oh, so-and-so's a genius. He says, that actors aren't geniuses. You know, basically, he, somebody said, okay, come out of your trailer right now after you've put on these clothes, say these lines, stand right here, say what we told you to say. He did it. He's a genius. <laughs> we, we have time for one more question. You had mentioned distributing or getting the information out on social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Has that been effective for you? I noticed that James Woods was banned from um, Instagram, and he's suddenly back in all his glory. So <laughs> I don't know how that works or how that would work for you. Well, I'm on Twitter. If you guys want to, you guys, you know, it's a knife fight on my Twitter timeline, but if you want to go there, I mean, yeah, that, th those things are available to a certain degree. There is what they call shadow banning on Twitter. I don't really know that much about it. I don't, I don't necessarily use Twitter as some sort of useful tool. I just use it for fun. I just like going on there and slapping these leftists around, poking them, <laughs> teasing them a little bit, you know. So I don't, I don't know if it's really, uh, an effective marketing tool, although, you know, people do use it that way. I, what I'm talking about is more about the real infrastructure of content and delivery. That's, that's what I want to do, and Twitter's not really about that. Please join me in thanking Mr. Searcy. Thank you. Thanks so much. I had a wonderful time. Thank you. <laughs>